Nakikita yes, niyo? Okay, sige. So good morning. Our topic for this morning will be on the diuretic agents. Actually, we already have discussed a little about diuretic drugs during our discussion for drugs uh, in heart, heart failure because this is one of the drugs that is used also for uh, heart failure. So diuretic are agents that will increase your urine volume while natriuretic causes an increase in your renal sodium excretion. So your natriuretics almost always also increase water excretions. So they are, also, they are usually called also as diuretics. So um, in the kidneys, you have, your, ano, you have your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So they are usually present in many different sites. And uh, the predominant location is your luminal membrane of the proximal convoluting tubule. And this catalyzes the dehydration of your um, carbonic acid. So by blocking these carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, this will also block your sodium uh, bicarbonate reabsorption. And this will cause now your diuresis. So your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are the forerunners of your modern diuretics. So they were discovered and uh, was found to have bacteriostatic uh, effects. Um, this will also cause an alkaline diuretics or diuresis and hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. So the prototype of your carbonic anhydrase inhibitor is your acetazolamide. <clears throat> so your acetazolamide is well absorbed after oral administration. It will increase or it, um, an increase in urine pH from the bicarbonate diuresis is apparent within 30 minutes um, at maximal effect of two hours and this will persist even up to 12 hours after a single dose. So the excretion of the drug is via secretion in the proximal tubule of your S2 segment. And so the dosing should be um, revised or reduced when you have renal insufficiency. So inhibition of your carbonic anhydrase activity will uh, depress your um, bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule. So at maximal dose, doses or dosage, 85% of your bicarbonate reabsorptive capacity is inhibited at the, by the, at the proximal convoluting tubule. Now, some of your um, bicarbonate can still be absorbed at other nephron sites by your carbonic anhydrase independent mechanism. So the overall effect here of your acetal acetazolamide at maximal doses, dosage is inhibition of the bicarbonate reabsorption, so 45%. Um, carbonic anhydrase inhibition also causes significant bicarbonate losses and hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Because of this reduced bicarbonate in the glomerular filtrate, this bicarbonate uh, depletion will lead to an enhanced sodium chloride reabsorption by the remainder of your nephron. So what are the major clinical applications of your acetazolamide? 
So it is also it is being used in um, patients with glaucoma or those with increased intracranial pressure because your acetosolamide would involve carbonic anhydrase dependent um, bicarbonate and fluid transport at sites other than the kidneys like your ciliary body because your ciliary body of the eye secretes also your bicarbonate from the blood into the aqueous humor. So that's why if you have increased um, um, increased pressure in your uh, patients with glaucoma, your acetosodamide has clinical effect on the secretions of your bicarbonate by the aqueous humor. Um, it is also being used in patients who have increased intracranial pressure because um, in your CSF, you have also formation of your um, bicarbonate. So you have secretions of your bicarbonate. So you have, if you have increased CSF, this will inhibit uh, CSF secretions of your bicarbonate. <clears throat> so these are the clinical indications. So as I've said, it is indicated for patients of gl glaucoma because it will reduce the aqueous humus humor formation by the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors by decreasing your intraocular pressure. So the effect is actually valuable in the management of glaucoma. And the most common indication for carbonic anhydrase inhibitor is for glaucoma. So typically, uh, uh, topically active carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are also available <clears throat> and these compounds can reduce intraocular pressure, although plasma levels are undetectable. So these are some of your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors that are orally um, used for the treatment in glaucoma. So you have your acetazolamide, your dichlorphenamide and your methazolamide. <clears throat> so the, the, these are the corresponding dosage of each of the oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. <clears throat> so your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are also used for urinary alkalinization, especially in the presence of kidney stones. So your uric acid, cysteine, and other weak acids are most easily reabsorbed from acidic urine. So renal excretion of cysteine and other weak acids can be enhanced by increasing your urinary, urinary pH with your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. So carbonic anhydrase inhibitors also are used for metabolic alkalosis. So metabolic alkalosis is generally treated by correction of your abnormalities in your total body potassium, in vascular volume, or the mineral, mineral or corticoid levels. So when alkalosis is due to excessive use of diuretics, especially in patients with uh, severe high heart failure, replacement of intravascular volume may be contraindicated because they are in heart failure. So in such cases, you can give your acetazolamide. So this can be useful in correcting the alkalosis as well as producing a small additional diuresis for correction of volume overload. So this is also used to rapidly correct the metabolic alkalosis that may develop in the setting of respiratory acidosis. So it is also used in patients who have acute mountain sickness. So your acute mountain sickness is characterized by weakness, dizziness, insomnia, headache, and nausea that can occur in mountain travelers who rapidly ascend above 3,000 meters. So the symptoms are usually mild and last for a few days. But in serious cases, they will have a rapidly progressing pulmonary or cerebral edema, and this can be 
life threatening. So decreasing your CSF formation and decreasing the pH of the cerebrospinal fluid and brain is important. So you can give your acetazolamide because this can increase ventilation and also diminish the symptoms of mountain sickness. So the other uses of acetazolamide is as uh, an adjuvant in the treatment of epilepsy. This is also used in some forms of hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And um, this is also used to increase urinary phosphate excretion during severe hyperphosphatemia. So toxicities of azetazolamide include hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. So the acidosis, uh, if your acidosis results from chronic reduction of body bicarbonate stores by carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, this will also limit the efficacy. So this will limit it, the diuretic efficacy of these drugs to two two or three days. So unlike uh, the diuretic effect, acidosis persists as long as the drug is continued. So it can also cause um, development of your renal stones. So you will have phosphatoria and hypercalceria occurring during bicarbonatoric response to your inhibitors of your carbonic anhydrase. So renal excretion of solubilizing factors may also decline with chronic use of uh, azetazolamide. Calcium salts are also relatively insoluble in alkaline pH, which means that there is a potential for renal stone formation from these salts. So another um, toxicity is renal potassium wasting. So potassium wasting can occur because your sodium presented to the collecting tubule is partially reabsorbed, including the lumen negative electrical potential in that segment and also enhancing your potassium secretion. So this effect be counteracted by simultaneous administration of potassium chloride. So the other toxicities include drosinous and paresthesias. These are actually common um, toxicities observed with large doses of azetazolamide. It can also um, lead to nervous system toxicity, especially in patients who have um, renal, renal disease or renal failure because your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors will accumulate in patients with renal failure leading to the development of your nervous system toxicities. So other toxicities include hypersensitivity reactions um, manifesting as either in the form of uh, fever, rashes, uh, bone marrow suppression, and interstitial neuritis. Contraindications of azetazolamide include in patients who have decompensated liver disease or patients who have cirrhosis because um, your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors will induce alkalinization of the urine and this will decrease your urinary excretion of your ammonia, contributing now to the development of your, of your hyperammonemia and hepatic encephalopathy in patients who have decompensated liver disease or cirrhosis. So for for loop diuretics, they are or selectively inhibit your sodium chloride reabsorption in the thick ascending limb. So it has large sodium chloride absorptive capacity in this segment, in this segment, and the diuretic action of these drugs uh, is not limited. By, by the development of your acidosis. So <clears throat> your low diuretics has through two prototype drugs. So these are your furosemide and your etacrinic acid. So loop diuretics are rapidly absorbed. They are eliminated by the kidney by 
glomerular filtration and tubular secretion. The absorption of your oral torsimide is more rapid, that is one hour, than your furosemide, which is um, absorbed for two to three hours. And this is nearly as complete as with your venous uh, administration. The duration of effect for furosemide is two to three hours, whereas your torsimide is four to six hours. So the half-life depends on the renal function of the patient. So these drugs will inhibit your sodium potassium chloride transporter or your NKCC2 in the luminal sodium potassium chloride transporter in the thick ascending limb of Henley's loop. So by inhibiting this transporter, the loop diuretics will reduce the reabsorption of sodium chloride. And it will also diminish the lumen positive potential that comes from potassium recycling. So this positive potential normally drives your divalent ion reabsorption in the loop and thereby loop diuretics will cause an increase in your magnesium and calcium excretion. So prolonged use of your loop diuretics can cause significant hypomagnesemia. So vitamin D induced intestinal absorption of calcium can be increased and calcium is actively reabsorbed in your distal convoluted tubule. So loop diuretics do not generally cause hypocalcemia. So loop diuretics also will induce synthesis of renal prostaglandins which participate in the renal action of your diuretics. So NSAIDs, like for example, your indomethacin, can interfere with the action of your loop diuretics by reducing prostaglandin synthesis in the kidney. That's why um, uh, you should not be giving your loop diuretics when uh, at the same time with your NSAIDs or your endomethacin because of this action. So loop agents also have direct effects on your blood flow through several vascular beds. So your furosemide increases renal blood flow and both furosemide and ethacrinic acid have also been shown to reduce pulmonary congestion and left ventricular feeling pressure in patients with heart failure. That's why as I've said earlier, um, your loop diuretic are also one of the drugs being used in patients who have heart failure. So there are some of your typical uh, loop diuretics and its corresponding doses. So these are some of the examples, your bumetanide, etacrinic acid, furosemide, and torsemide. So what are the clinical uses of your um, loop diuretics? So it's being used in patients who have hyperkalemia. So after acute management of severe hyperkalemia by other measures, you can give your loop diuretics. So this can significantly enhance the urinary excretion of your potassium. So this is enhanced by uh, simultaneous sodium chloride and water administration. So this is also being used in patients who have acute renal failure. So loop agents can increase the rate of urine flow and also enhance your potassium excretion in patients with acute renal failure. If you have a large pigment load, which has precipitated the acute renal failure, your loop agents can help in flushing out this intratubular cast and also ameliorate your intratubular obstruction. So loop agents can theoretically worsen cast formation in myeloma and light chain nephropathy. So the drug is also used for um, an ion overdose. So this is useful in treating toxic ingestions of bromide, fluoride, and iodide, which are reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb. So saline solu solution must be administered to replace the urinary losses of sodium 
and to provide chloride so as to avoid extracellular fluid volume depletion. So the toxicities include hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, autotoxicity, hyperuricemia, hypomagnesemia, and some allergic reactions like skin rash, eosinophilia, and interstitial nephritis. So furosemide, bumetanide, and tercimide may exhibit allergic cross-reactivity in patients who are sensitive to other sulfonamides. So you have to be very careful also in administering this drug in patients who have um, known reactions to sulfonamides. Also, overzealous use of diuretics um, is dangerous in patients who have hepatic cirrhosis because it can precipitate hepatic encephalopathy, also borderline renal failure, and in patients who have heart failure. You, may, you might be asking, why, why would um, furosemide be contraindicated in patients with heart failure when in fact it is the treatment to, to decongest patients who have heart failure? Um, if you have uh, or overzealous use of diuretic may cause um, hypotension and patients who have heart failure usually have elevated dysfunction. It could further uh, aggravate your heart failure because of the development of your low output syndrome in patients who have heart failure. So thiazides um, is also another form of diuretic and it inhibits your sodium chloride transport frequently in the distal convoluting tubule. So there are some members of the thiazides that obtain significant carbonic anhydrase inhibitory activity. So the prototype is your hydrochlorothiazide. So all of the thiazides have unsubstituted sulfonamide group. So they are all administered orally. Your chlorothiazide, which is the parent of the group, is not lipid soluble. So it should be given in relatively large doses. So this is the only thiazide that is available for parenteral administration. Your chlorothalidone is slowly absorbed and has a longer duration of action, while your indapamide is excreted primarily by the biliary system. So the active form is cleared by the kidney to exert its diuretic effect in the distal convoluting tubule. So all of the thiazides are secreted by the organic acid secretory system in the proximal tubule and will compete with the secretion of your uric acid in that system. So your thiazide also may blunt your uric acid secretion, so it may elevate your serum uric acid level. So that's why your thiazide in patients who have gout may precipitate acute flare of your uh, or acute gouty flare in patients who have gout. So thiazides inhibit sodium chloride reabsorption from the luminal side of the epithelial cells in the distal convoluting tubule by blocking the sodium chloride transporter. So thiazides also enhance your calcium reabsorption. So this enhancement has been postulated to result from effects in both the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. In the proximal tubule, thiazide will induce uh, volume depletion leading to enhanced sodium and passive calcium reabsorption. While in the distal convoluting tubule, it will lower your intracellular sodium by thiazide-induced blockade of sodium entry and enhance your sodium-calcium sodium exchange in the 
basolateral membrane and increases your overall reabsorption of calcium. So they can unmask hypercalcemia due to other causes like hyperparathyroidism, carcinoma, and sarcoidosis. So thiazides are also useful in the treatment of kidney stones caused by hypercalciuria. And uh, the action of your thiazide depends also in part to the renal prostaglandin production. So it can also inhibit your NSAIDs under certain uh, conditions. So these are some of the examples of your thiazides and its corresponding doses. So you have your bendroflow methiazide, your chlorothiazide, chlorthalidone, hydrochlorothiazide, and hydrofluo methiazide. So it's very easy to, to uh, determine whether they are thiazides or they are loop diuretics. Kasi pag thiazide, it yeah, last, ano, last, um, last, What's this letter are the Z I D E side, your side. So thiazide, bendroflomethiazide, chlorothiazide, hydrochlorothiazide, and chlorthalidone lang. But your chlorthalidone is um, in I form. So you have your other, I know, other. Um, Thiazides in dapamide. So dapamide is available in the market. Your methiclothiazide, parang hindi na to available in here. I don't know in other and other areas like in Manila. Metolason, this is available. Your polythiazide, kinethazone, and your trichlormethiazide. <clears throat> so toxicities includes hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis and hyperuricemia, impaired carbohydrate tolerance, um, hyperlipidemia, hyponatremia, allergic reactions, and other toxicities including weakness, fatigability, paresthesias, similar to those observed with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. It can also cause impotence. So the drug is contraindicated in patients with hepatic cirrhosis, borderline renal failure, or heart failure. Then you have your potassium-sparing diuretics. They prevent potassium secretion by antagonizing the effects of aldosterone at the late distal and cortical collecting tubules. So by inhibition, or the inhibition may occur by direct pharmacologic antagonism of your mineralocorticoid receptors. So you have your spiractone and eplerinone. These are some of your potassium-sparing diuretics. So inhibition also of your sodium influx through ion channels in the luminal membrane can also spare your uh, potassium. An example of this is your amyloride and your triamterin. So spironolactone is a synthetic steroid that acts as a competitive antagonist to aldosterone. So the onset and duration of action is determined by the kinetics of the aldosterone response in the target tissue. So you have substantial inactivation of spironolactone in the liver. So spironolactone has slow onset of action, requiring several days before full therapeutic effect. Um, while your eplerinone, this is also a spironolactone analog with greater selectivity for the aldosterone receptor. So um, amyloride and triamterin, they are direct inhibitors of sodium influx in the collecting tubule. So your triamterin is uh, metabolized in the liver, but the renal secre excretion is a major route of elimination for the active form and the metabolites. So this is extensively metabolized, so it has a short half-life and should be given 
more frequently than amiloride. So your potassium sparing diuretics will reduce sodium absorption in the collectubules and ducts. Sodium absorption at this site is regulated by aldosterone. So your aldosterone antagonist will interfere with this uh, process. So similar effects are also observed with respect to your hydrogen handling by the intercalated cells of the collecting tubule, in part explaining the metabolic acidosis seen with aldosterone antagonists. Spirolactone and eplerinone bind to your aldosterone receptors, and this may reduce the intracellular formation of your active metabolites of aldosterone. While your amiloride and triamterin, this will not block your aldosterone receptor, but instead it will directly interfere with the sodium in entry through the epithelial sodium ion channels in the apical membrane of the collecting tubule. So since your potassium secretion is coupled with sodium in entry in this segment, these agents are also effective potassium sparing diuretics. So these are some of your toxicities with observed with your potassium sparing diuretics. So it can uh, cause hyperkalemia, natural kasi potassium sparing siya. Hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, gynecomastia. This is commonly seen in patients with uh, or taking um, aldosterone blocker, your spironolactone. Um, acute renal failure, and kidney stones. So um, your potassium sparing diuretics can cause severe fatal hyperkalemia in susceptible patients. So we have to be very careful because uh, fatal hyperkalemia will cause bradi, uh, bradyarrhythmia and may even lead to asystole. Kaya nga, di ba, it mga ginlilital injection, potassium ito ginahatag. So, nag, it will cause, your hyperkalemia will cause asistole and cardiac arrest. So, you have to be very careful in susceptible patients. Um, <clears throat> oral potassium administration should also be discontinued if potassium sparing diuretics are admin, administered. Um, you have also to be careful in patients who have chronic renal insufficiency, especially um, they are the ones who are vulnerable and they are rarely treated with these diuretics. So it's one of the ano, contraindications. Um, also, concomitant use of other agents that will blunt your renin angiotensin system like your ACE inhibitors and your ARBs. This will increase the likelihood of hyperkalemia. Also in patients with liver disease, so it's also contraindicated. They may have uh, an impairment in the metabolism of triamterin and spironolactone. So dosing must be carefully adjusted. Also, with those uh, taking um, CYP3A4 inhibitors like your ketoconazole or itraconazole, they can markedly increase also your blood levels of iplerinone, and this may lead to hyperkalemia. <clears throat> then you have your agents that will alter your water excretion. So this include your osmotic diuretics. So your proximal tubule and descending limb of Hendy's loop are permeable to water. So any osmotically active agents that is filtered by the glomerulose but not reabsorbed causes water to be retained in these segments. And this will promote water diuresis. So agents that can be used to reduce intracranial pressure, and promote prompt removal of renal toxins. So this is one of the uh, use for your osmotic diuresis. 
So the prototype of your osmotic diuresis or diuretic is your mannitol. So your osmotic diuretics are poorly absorbed. So that's it, it is given parenterally. And if administered orally, it may cause osmotic diarrhea. So mannitol is not metabolized and this is excreted by glomerular filtration within 30 to 60 minutes without any important tubular reabsorption or secretion. Your osmotic diuretics have made have their major effect in the proximal tubule and the descending limb of Henle's loop. So through osmotic effects, they will oppose the action of your ADH in the collecting tubule. The presence of a non-reabsorbable sol solute such as mannitol will also prevent the normal absorption of water by interposing a countervailing osmotic force, resulting in increased urine volume. So this will increase in your urine flow. This will also decrease the contact time between the fluid and the tubular epithelium, thus reducing your sodium as well as water reabsorption. So the resulting natriuresis is of lesser magnitude when you are using your osmotic diuret diuretic than water diuresis, leading to um, excessive water loss and hypernatremia. So your osmotic diuretic can be used to increase your urine volume. They are used to increase water excretion in the presence of sodium excretion. So the effect here can be useful when you have avid sodium retention that will limit the response to your uh, conventional agents. So it is also used to uh, maintain urine volume and to prevent anuria that might uh, result from presentation of large pigment loads to the kidney. So in the presence of hemoly hemolysis or rhabdomyolysis. So you can give a test dose first of your mannitol before you start with your continuous infusion. So the test dose is 12.5 grams intravenously. So mannitol should not be continued unless there is an increase in urine flow rate to more than 50 ml per hour during the three hours following your test dose. Then mannitol can be repeated every one to two hours to maintain a urine flow rate greater than 100 ml per hour. So one of the uses of your um, osmotic diuretic is the reduction of your intracranial and intraocular pressure. So your osmotic diuretics will alter the starling forces that water leave the cell and reduce the intracellular volume. So this effect is used to reduce intracranial pressure in neurologic conditions and to reduce intraocular pressure before ophthalmologic pressure procedures. So the dose is one to two gram per kilogram of mannitol given intravenously. For intracranial pressure, uh, you have to monitor the fall of your pressure uh, within 60 to 90 minutes. So th this is expected. So you expect that there is a fall in your intracranial pressure within 60 to 90 minutes. So toxicities include um, extracellular volume expansion, dehydration, hyperkalemia, and hypernatremia. Then you have your antidiuretic hormone agonists. So your vasopressin and desmopressin. They are used in the treatment of central diabetes insipidus. So you have your conivoptan, lithium, and demiclocycline. They are orally active. Your conivoptam and demiclocycline have half lives of five to 10 hours. While your lithium, this is actually a um, psychiatric drug and this is never used as an ADH antagonist. 
but it has an effect just like your um, conivoptam and demiclocycline. So it has an antidiuretic hormone effect. So your antidiuretic hormone antagonist will inhibit the effects of your ADH in the collecting tubule. So your conivoptam is a pharmacologic antagonist at V1 and V2 receptors. Both your lithium and demiclocycline reduce the formation of cyclic adenosine monophosphate in response to ADH. And it will also interfere the actions of your cyclic AMP in the collecting tubule. So the drug is used for the treatment of syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic secretion or SIADH. So your antidiuretic hormone antagonists are used to manage SIDH when water restriction has failed to correct the abnormality. So initially, you, you manage it by water restriction. But if this will fail, you give now your uh, antidiuretic hormone antagonists. So your lithium carbonate has been used also to treat syndrome, but the response is unpredictable. Demic demis demiclocycline uh, can be given at 600 to 1,200 milligrams uh, per day, and this will yield a more predictable result, and this is less toxic. So the appropriate plasma level should be two micrograms per ml, and this should be maintained by monitoring. While your conivitam is administered by intravenous injection. So it is not suitable for chronic use in outpatients. So other uses of your antidiuretic hormone antagonists, like uh, this is used also in uh, patients who have elevated antidiuretic hormones in response to um, diminished effective circulating blood volume, which is often uh, seen in patients who have CHF or congestive heart failure. So when treatment by volume replacement is not desirable because these patients are usually um, have congestion. So hyponatremia may result. So as for, um, just like your SIADH, water restriction is the treatment of choice. But if it is not successful, you can give your democlocycline or conibaptan. So toxicities includes nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, renal failure, and the other toxicities like for dem demiclocycline, um, this may further aggravate the conditions of liver disease, and it should also be not be used in patients younger than 12 years old. So there are now available combinations of your diuretics, like combining your dupe agents and thiazides. So if you want to, um, the maximal effect of your diuretic, so you can give a combination of your loop agents and thiazides. So metalazone or metolazone, I mean, is the usual thiazide-like drug that is used in patients refractory to loop agents alone. But it is likely that other thiazides would be as effective as metolazone. So the combination of your loop diuretics and thiazides can mobilize large amount of fluid, even in patients who have not responded to a single agent. However, close hemodynamic monitoring is essential because it may cause um, hypotension. So in patients who have, for example, um, who, who have renal failure, this may further aggravate the condition kasi di ba pag hypotension, you reduce your renal flow, this will further impair the renal function. So it will aggravate your, further your renal failure. So furthermore, um, potassium wasting is extremely common. 
So it may require parenteral potassium administration with careful monitoring of fluid and electrolyte status. A combination of your potassium sparing diuretic and loop agents or thiazides. So pede yun then combination of this. So hypokalemia eventually develop in many patients who are placed on loop diuretics. So you can, why well, you can combine a potassium sparing and a loop diuretic or a thiazide. So they can be managed also with, with dietary sodium chloride restriction or with dietary uh, potassium chloride su uh, supplements. So when hypokalemia cannot be managed in this way, the addition of your potassium sparing diuretic can significantly lower your potassium excretion. So however, it should be avoided in patients with renal insufficiency and in those risking angiotensin antagonists such as ACE inhibitors in whom life-threatening hyperkalemia can develop in response to your potassium sparing diuretics. So for your um, clinical pharmacology of the different diuretic agents, you can find this. You have There's a table in the book. So it's a summary of the effects of your diuretics on the urinary electrolytes. So I guess that's my last slide. Thank you for listening. Okay. Nag attendance na kamo. I'll take a picture po again. So you open your ano, you open your cameras or your videos. So this topic and my uh, other topic your what's this and the will not be included in your first bimonthly exam huh so all the topics of dr iskibel which you have discussed and our and my topic up to the anti-arrhythmic and aton last nga quiz di ba anti-arrhythmic medications bad to Oh, will be included in the first bimonthly. But this one, your diuretics, hindi na siya included. It should be, it will be included in the second bimonthly, but we will be having a quiz after your bimonthly for this one. So for my group in the clinics, this afternoon, you prepare, ha? Huh? Because we will have our recording. Prepare band papers. I will give you instructions later na. Okay po, Doc. Thank you po. Uh, and group, nags